Good evening. Once again, we return to the story of Caius. Spellsword. Dunmer. Eternal champion. Former agent of the Emperor. Current head of the Blade in Svartenfell. Hortator. Nerevarine. Chosen of Azura. And... Hmm. Justice never sleeps. Fedris Hilaire. I need to find a Fedris Hilaire. And in the temple reception area. But before I do that, I have some items I'd like to try and sell. Your words are your measure, Sarah. Greetings, Dark Elf. Perhaps you'd like to hear the latest rumors? Why not? Have you heard? A terribly powerful and evil wizard, something rather Vellus, I think they said, has taken up residence nearby. At the bar the other night, they were talking of the strange lights and sinister laughter late at night. I'd be on my toes if I were you. I'll bet this wizard will try to make this display of his power soon. I'm not too worried. I see we've already been here. We all speak well. You in My god. Greetings, fair citizens of Mournhole. I am the great, renowned, respected, and feared wizard, Orvin Vellis. In the coming weeks, you shall see more and more of me as I bring the city to its knees. But for the moment, allow me to demonstrate my power on one of your hapless countrymen. You there! Yes, you, ugly dark elf. Prepare to feel my wrath. Today, Orvis Veles magically appeared before me, announced he was going to put on a display of his power, and then attack me. Oddly enough, he went down far too easily and scarcely harmed me. I wonder what this could mean. I have ears. I shall hear. I saw you fight with that wizard, Gaius. It was, certainly was interesting. I expected with all the rumors of how powerful and evil he was, he would be tougher than he appeared. Hmm. Do you say his name was Verlus, right? It's a Vellus manor in God's Reach. Perhaps checking that out would shed some much-needed light on this mystery. Alright, let's see if we can find this temple reception area. I do want to go back down in the sewers to do the, uh, to do the task, but obviously I'm a bit burdened. I may actually have to make a trip back to Balmora, but... Give to the temple and receive the blessings of Almalexia. Tell me more. Our wealth dies with us, my child, but our good deeds outlive us all. Would you care to make a donation to the temple to receive the blessings of the Lady of Mercy? What's Almalexia going to do with this money? Almalexia watches over all her children, the sick, the needy, the poor. Well, not actually in person. She used to in person, you know. She's made no public appearance for years, and so the temple takes care of her children for her. That's where the money goes, child. Tell me more about that. You know about Amsevi, the living gods of our temple? Gods, but at the same time, living folks like you and me. Amalexia, the Lady of Mercy, walked the streets of Mournhold herself, healed the sick, fed the poor, gave them clothes and from her own hand. The same with Lord Byvek. Then ten years ago, about the time of the ghost fence, they stopped appearing in public. I well, needed all of Almsevi's power for the ghost fence, they said. High priests still talk with them, but we don't see them. Tell me more about the Lady of Mercy. Amalexia is the mother of us all, healer and protector. Always has been. I suppose she doesn't seem that way now, in the war with Dagothur. It's hard for us. It's hard for all of us. She's had to change and tougher, toughen herself and her followers. 
It's true that sometimes dissenters disappear when they question her doctrines. The hands of Almalexia are more like inquisitors than knights of loving mercy, and Mournhold doesn't feel much like the city of love anymore. But hard times demand hard gods. Tell me more about the hand of Almalexia. They're Almalexia's personal guards, body and soul, scimitar and armor fortified by divine enchantments, pledged to honor and protect and serve Almalexia in all ways. They used to spend much of their time punishing criminals and pro uh, protecting the people. Now they spend all their time protecting Amalexia. I suppose that's right, but it makes me uneasy. It sends the wrong signal. Vengeful might rather than vigilant mercy. What about the ghost fence? Thanks to you, Nerevarine, Dagother is dead. We don't need the ghost fence. So then what about the living gods? Amalexia and Vivek have always been among us, our fathers and forefathers to many, uh, many generations, living and speaking gods and ancestors, guardians and heroes. So the Sill, he's the father of mysteries and always kept to himself, but long ago even he used to appear now and then. That's the difference between the temple and the western phase. We have gods who were once mortals. They understand what it's like to live, eat, sleep, suffer, worry, and to fear death. What about Talos? Something tells me I'm not going to be able to sell these. Close. Happy to help. What's your problem? Temple's as clean as Almalexia's conscience, Sarah, and mind that you keep it that way. Paris. Oh, Velas. Ah, uh, you're the one who's recently arrived in Mournhold from Vardenfell. I was told of your arrival. I understand that you had some problems with the Dark Brotherhood. An interesting group, and usually rather effective. I'm surprised you're still alive. Perhaps you have potential, or they sent incompetence. I believe you might be of service to the lady. Tell me about the Dark Brotherhood before you tell me about service. It's, it's an interesting group, effective. Fear and mystery are powerful tools for them. They have been, there have been kings that have been rumored to utilize their services, but that is only a rumor, of course. Tell me about yourself. I am Fred Siller. What do you want? Tell me about your background. You may call me Fedris Hair. Uh, what I do is my own affair. Fine, then let's talk about service to your lady. I'm always aware of those who may be able to serve our lady Almalexia. Few are worthy to do so. The temple and the city are guarded by the high ordinators, and the hands fulfill other duties of the, for the lady. I am her chief steward, Fedris Lair. Now, if you wish to be of use, we have some matters to discuss. Why don't you tell me more about your milady first? The Lady Almalexia resides here in the High Temple. We in Mournhold all live under her protection. Fine, let's talk about matters. Perhaps you've already met the young king Hlalu Helseth, a foul man unworthy to sit on a throne. Well, let's not be too hasty about the Hlalu. Still, he holds the right of succession. The lady must keep an ever-watchful eye on this king, though, lest he do something that would be detrimental to the temple, our fair city, or perhaps all of Morrowind. Currently, there are some concerns about some new recruits that Helseth seems to be training. Well, tell me about him before you tell me about his recruits. Our new young king. He's ruthless and not foolish, as some would have you believe. He has some of his mother's political savvy, and he has all of his father's ruthlessness. All right. Tell me about the new recruits. A standing army is nothing new in the city, though it is largely unnecessary. Mornhold is protected by her walls from the outside and Our Lady Almalexia from within. None would dare mount an attack here. Still, tradition dictates that the king maintain an army. We believe that Helseth is raising quite a different sort of army. A goblin army. What? Foul, vicious creatures. No wonder Helseth has chosen them to be his foot soldiers. I know the goblins are being trained nearby, though not where exactly. Ask around the city about goblins. Someone will know. 
I wish for you to find the location of the goblin training area, and when you do, kill the war chiefs. There should be two. Sever the head of the army, and the rest will shatter like a scrib. You might rid the city of their two Altmer trainers as well. Complete the task, and the lady will be pleased. Well, tell me about the Altmer trainers. I want to know that they're worth killing. Traditionally, the Altmer have used goblins to reinforce their armies. Why, I do not know. Rumor has it that Helseth has contracted two Altmer to train his goblin army. If you find these Altmer, it would be a service to rid the city of them as well. According to Lair Alexia considers the goblins an abomination and is horrified that Helseth would consider using the beasts as soldiers. The goddess worries that the temperamental Helseth will lose control of the creatures and that they will attack Mournhold. I am to kill the goblin war chiefs and report back to Lair. Although he did not know where the goblins were being trained, perhaps one of the locals has more information. In addition to the two goblin war chiefs, Lair mentioned that there are at least two Altmer in charge of training the goblins for Helseth. If I can get rid of them, the goddess will be pleased. I'd be happy to talk. Oh, fine. I don't suppose you know anything about goblins. Goblins? And Mornhold? I've heard some odd stories of creatures in the sewers beneath God's Reach. I never thought that they might be goblins. Terrible creatures. There have been reports of strange creatures in and around the sewers of God's uh, the God's Reach area of Mournhold. This is where the goblins I could be where the goblins are hiding. So. All right. I was hoping I might be able to see a little bit more of Mournhold, but we might even be able to meet uh, Elseth at some point. But for now, let's just focus on um, let's focus on uh, completing our tasks. You also want to investigate some of these secondary matters. Oh, actually, you know what? It pains me to do this, but... It also gives me a chance to do some more reading. Okay, so I'm keeping the katana. The tanto is probably somewhere down here. Broadsword, longsword. These are short swords. Alright, I keep the they're all short blades. All right, well, let's try and make the most of, um, resources we've got. I actually don't remember how to get to Mournhold, but we should be able to find that pretty easily. occur to me that in my introductions I'm actually failing to include all of my ranks and some of the guilds, but it's already pretty long. That's one Ooh, ugly outfit. What are you talking about? Not even close. 
Now he's only got 400. All right. I think I'm just going to have to leave all of that behind. me right now, so I'm going to, uh, I'm just going to replenish my, uh, my stock. I'm going to worry about the details later. this I do apparently I've read it. fair enough ah yes brief history of the Empire well no time like the present um, start with number one. A Brief History of the Empire, Part 1, by Stronach Cathodge III, Imperial Historian. Before the rule of Tiber Septim, all of Tamriel was in chaos. The poet uh, or Trachysis uh, called that period of continuous unrest the days and nights of blood and venom. The kings were a petty lot of grasping tyrants who fought Tiber's attempts to bring order to the land. But they were as disorganized as they were dissolute, and the strong hand of Septim brought the peace forcibly to Tamriel. The year was the Second Era, 896. The following year, the Emperor declared the beginning of a new era, thus began the Third Era, year aught. For 38 years, the Emperor Tiber reigned supreme. It was a lawful, pious, and glorious age, when justice was known to one and all, from serf to sovereign. On Tiber's death, it re written. Sorry, it reigned for an entire fortnight, as if the land of Tamriel itself was weeping. The emperor's grandson, Pelagius, came to the throne. Though his reign was short, he was as strong and resolute as his father had been, and Tamriel could have enjoyed a continuation of the Golden Age. Alas, for an unknown enemy of the Septim family hired the accursed organization of cutthroats, the Dark Brotherhood, to kill the emperor Pelagius I as he knelt at prayer at the Temple of the One at the Imperial City. Pelagius I's reign lasted less than three years. Pelagius had no living children, so the crown imperial passed to his first cousin, the daughter of Tiber's brother Angranith, uh, Kintara, the former queen of Sylvanar, assumed her thr throne as Kintara I. Her reign was blessed with prosperity and good harvest, and she herself was an avid, avid patroness of art, music, and dance. Uh, Kintira's son was crowned after her death, the first emperor of Tamriel to use the imperial name Uriel. Uriel I was a great lawmaker of the Septim dynasty and promoter of the independent organizations and guilds. Under his kind but firm hand, the Fighters Guild and the Mages Guild increased in prominence throughout Tamriel. His son and successor, Uriel II, reigned for 18 years, from the death of Uriel I in the Third Era 64 to Pelagius II's accession in Third Era 82. 
Tragically, the reign of Uriel II was cursed with blights, plagues, and insurrections. The tenderness he inherited from his father did not serve Tamriel well, and little justice was done. Pelagius II inherited not only the throne from his father, but the debt from the latter's poor financial and judicial management. Pelagius dismissed all of the Elder Council and allowed only those willing to pay great sums to resume their seats. He encouraged similar acts among his vassals, by the, king, uh, the kings of Tamriel, and by the end of his 17-year reign, Tamriel had returned to prosperity. His critics, however, have suggested that any advisor possessed of wisdom, but not of gold, had been summarily ousted by Pelagius. This may have led to some of the troubles his son, Antiochus, faced when, his, uh, sorry, when he in turn became emperor. Antiochus was certainly one of the more flamboyant members of the usually austere Septim family. He had numerous mistresses and was nearly as many wives, and was renowned for the grandeur of his dress and his high good humor. Unfortunately, his reign was rife with civil war, surpassing even that of his grandfather, Uriel II. The War of the Isle in Third Era 110, 12 years after Antiochus assumed the throne, nearly took the province of Somerset Isle away from Tamriel. The united alliance of the kings of Somerset and Antiochus only managed to defeat King Organ of the island kingdom of uh, Pyadenea due to a freak storm. Legend credits the psychic order of the Isle of Arteum with the sorcery behind this tempest. The story of uh, Kintira II, heiress to her father Antiochus' throne, is certainly one of the saddest tales in imperial history. Her first cousin Uriel, son of Queen Potema of Solitude, accused uh, Kin sorry, Kintira of being a bastard, alluding to the infamous decadence of, her, of the imperial city during her father's reign. When this accusation failed to stop her coronation, Uriel brought the support of several disgruntled kings of High Rock, Skyrim, and Morrowind, and with Queen Potema's assistance, he coordinated three attacks on the Septim Empire. The first attack occurred in the Iliac Bay region, which separates High Rock from, and Hammerfell. Kintira's entourage was massacred and the Empress taken captive. For two years, Kintira II languished in an imperial prison believed to be somewhere in Glenpoint or Glen, uh, Glenmoral before she was slain in her cell under mysterious circumstances. The second attack was on a series of imperial garrisons along the coastal Morrowind Islands. The Empress's consort, uh, Contin Aranix, sorry, yeah, Aranix fell defending the forts. The third and final attack was a siege on the imperial city itself, occurring after the Elder Council had split up the army to attack the east, uh, western High Rock and eastward Morwen. The weakened government had little defense against Uriel's determined aggression, and capitulated after only a fortnight of resistance. Uriel took the throne that same evening and proclaimed himself Uriel III, Emperor of Tamriel. The year was Third Era 121, and thus began the War of the Red Diamond, described in Volume 2 of this series. Brief History of the Empire, Part 2, by Stronach Kithaj III, Imperial Historian. Volume 1 of this series described the brief lives of the first eight emperors of the Septim dynasty, beginning with the glorious Tiber Septim and ending with his great-great-great-great-grandniece, Kintara II. Kintara's murder in Glenpoint while in captivity was considered by some to be the end of the pure strain of Septim blood in the imperial family. Certainly, it marks the end of something significant. Uriel III not only proclaimed himself Emperor of Tamriel, but also Uriel Septim III, taking the eminent surname as, his ti as a title. In truth, his surname was uh, Mantikero from his father's line. In time, Uriel III was deposed and his crimes reviled, but the tradition of taking the name Septim as a title for the Emperor of Tamriel did not die with him. For six years, the War of the Red Diamond, which takes its name from the Septim family's famous badge, tore the Empire apart. The combatants were three sur the three surviving children of Pelagius II, Potema, Sepphoris, and Magnus, and their various offspring. Potema, of course, supported her son Uriel III, and had the combined support of all of Skyrim and, the nor and northern Morrowind. With the efforts of Sepphoris and Magnus, however, the province of High Rock turned coat. The provinces of Hammerfell, Somerset Isle, Valenwood, Aylesware, and Black Marsh were divided in their loyalty, but most kings supported Sepphoris and Magnus. In the Third Era, 127, Uriel III was captured at the Battle of Ikidag in Hammerfell. En route to his trial in the Imperial City, a mob overtook the prisoner's carriage and burned him alive within it. His captor and uncle continued on in the, uh, to the Imperial City and, by common acclaim, was proclaimed Sepphoris I, Emperor of Tamriel. Sepphoris' reign was marked by nothing but war. By all accounts, he was a kind and intelligent man, but when Tamriel needed, was a great warrior, and that he, unfortunately, was, and he, fortunately, was that. 
It took an additional 10 years of constant warfare for him to defeat his sister Potema, the so-called Wolf Queen of Solitude who died in the siege of his city-state in the year 137. Zephyrus survived his sister by only three years. He never had time during the war to marry, so it was his brother, the fourth child of Pelagius II, who assumed the throne. The Emperor Magnus was already elderly when he took up the imperial diadem, and the business of punishing the traitorous kings of the War of the Red Diamond drained much of his remaining strength. Legend accuses Magnus' son and heir, Pelagius III, of patricide, but that seems highly unlikely for no other reason that the Pelagius was the king of solitude following the death of Potema, and seldom visited the imperial city. Pelagius III, sometimes called Pelagius the Mad, was proclaimed emperor in the 145th year of the Third Era. Almost from the start, his eccentricities and uh, a behavior of, were noticed at court. He embarrassed dignitaries, offended the vassal kings, and on a, one occasion marked the end of an imperial grand ball by attempting to hang himself. His long-suffering wife was uh, finally rewarded with the regency of Tamriel, and Pelagius III was sent to a series of healing institutions and asylums until his death in the Third Era 153 at the age of 34. The Empress Regent of Tamriel was proclaimed Empress Cataraya I upon the death of her husband. Some who do not mark the end of the Septim bloodline with the death of Kintera II consider the ascendancy of this dark elf woman to be the true mark of its decline. Her defenders, on the other hand, assert that though Cataraya was not descended from Tiber, the son that she had with Pelagius was, so the imperial chain did continue. Despite racist assertions to the contrary, Cataraya's 46th year reign was one of the most celebrated in Tamriel's history. Uncomfortable in the Imperial City, Cataraya traveled extensively throughout the Empire, such as no Emperor had ever done since Tiber's day. She repaired much of the damage that the previous Emperor's broken alliances and bungled diplomacy created. The people of Tamriel came to love their Empress far more than the nobility did. Cataraya's death at a, in a minor skirmish in Black Marsh is a favorite subject of conspiracy-minded historians. Sage, Montalius' discovery, for instance, of a disenfranchised branch of the Septim family and their involvement with the skirmish was a revelation indeed. When Cassander assumed the throne upon the death of his mother, he was already middle-aged. Only half-elven, he aged like a Breton. In fact, he had left the rule of Wayrest to his half-brother Uriel due to poor health. Nevertheless, as the only true blood re relation of Pelagius and thus Tiber, he was pressed into accepting the throne. To no one's surprise, the Emperor Cassander's reign did not last long. In two years, he joined his predecessors in internal slumber. Uriel Lariat, Cassander's half-brother and the child of Cataraya I and her imperial consort, Galavir Lariat, after the death of Pelagius III, left the kingdom of Wayrest to reign as Uriel IV. Legally, Uriel IV was a septum. Cassander had adopted him into the royal family when he had become king of Wayrest. Nevertheless, to the council and the people of Tamriel, he was a bastard child of Cataraya. Uriel did not possess the dynamism of his mother, and his long 43-year reign was a hotbed of sedition. Uriel the Fourth story is told in the third volume of this series. A Brief History of the Empire, Part 3, by Stronach Cathaj, the third imperial historian. The first volume of this series told the story of the succession of the first eight emperors of the Septim dynasty for Tiber I to Kitara II. The second volume described the War of the Red Diamond and the six emperors that followed its aftermath from Uriel III to Cassander I. At the end of that volume, it was described how Emperor Cassander's half-brother, Uriel IV, assumed the, th uh, the throne of the Empire, Empire of Tamriel. It will be recalled that Uriel IV was not a septum by birth. His mother, though she reigned as an empress for many years, was a dark elf married to a true septum emperor, Pelagius III. Uriel's father was actually Cataria I's consort after Pelagius' death, a Breton nobleman named Galavir Lariat. Before taking the throne of empire, Cassander I had ruled the kingdom of Wayrest, but poor health had forced him to retire. Cassander had no children, so he legally adopted his half-brother, Uriel, and abdicated the kingdom. Seven years later, Cassander inherited the empire at the death of his mother. Three years after that, Uriel once again found himself the recipient of Cassander's inheritance. Uriel IV's reign was lo a long and difficult one. Despite being legally adopted member of the Septim family, and despite the Lariat family's high position, indeed they were distant cousins of the Septims, few of the Elder Council could be persuaded to accept him fully as a blood descendant of Tiber. The Council had assumed much responsibility during Cataria I's long reign and Cassander I's short one, and a strong-willed alien monarch like Uriel IV found it impossible to command their unswerving fealty. Time and again the Council and Emperor were at odds, and time and again the Council won the battles. 
Since the days of Pelagius II, the Elder Council had consisted of the wealthiest men and women in the Empire, and the power they wielded was conclusive. The Council's last victory over Uriel IV was post uh, posthumous. Andorak, Uriel IV's son, was disinherited by vote of the Council, and a cousin more closely related to the original Septim line was proclaimed Sephiroth II in the Third Era 268. For the first time in nine years of Sephir sorry, for the first nine years of Sephiroth II's reign, those loyal to Andrak battled the Imperial forces. In an act that the sage Arantine called Tiber Septim's heart beating no more, the council granted Andrak the High Rock Kingdom and Shornhelm to the end of the war, and Andrak's descendants still rule there. By and large, Sephiroth II had foes that uh, demanded more from his attention than Andrak, from out of the Cimmerian nightmare, in the words of Arantine. A man who called himself the Camor, uh, sorry, the Camoran usurper, led an army of Daedra and undead warriors on a rampage through Valenwood, conquering the kingdom after kingdom. Few could resist his onslaughts. As month turned into bloody month in the year Third Era 249, even fewer tried. Sephiroth the Second sent more and more mercenaries into Hammerfell to stop the usurper's northward march, but they were bribed or slaughtered and raised as undead. The story of the Camorran Usurper deserves a book of its own. It is recommended that the reader find Pollux Ilithir's The Fall of the Usurper in more detail, for more detail. In short, however, the destruction of the forces of the Usurper had little to do with the efforts of the Emperor. The result was a great regional victory and an increase in hostility toward the seemingly ineffectious Empire. Uriel V, Sephiroth the Second's son and successor, swiveled opinion back toward the latent power of the Empire. Turning the attention of Tamriel away from internal strife, Uriel V embarked on a series of invasions, beginning almost from the moment he took the throne in the Third Era 268. Uriel V conquered uh, Roscrea in 271, Kathonke, uh, sorry, Kathonke in 276, Yenslea in 279, and Esernet in 284. In the Third Era 288, he embarked on his most ambitious enterprise, the invasion of the continent kingdom of Akavir. This ultimately proved a failure, for two years later, Uriel V was killed in Akavir on the battlefield of Ioneth. Nevertheless, Uriel V holds a reputation as second only to Tiber as one of the two great warrior emperors of Tamriel. The last four emperors, beginning with Uriel V's infant son, are described in the fourth and final volume of this series. A Brief History of the Empire, Part 4, by Stronach Cathodge III, Imperial Historian. The first book of this series described in brief the first eight emperors of the Septim dynasty, beginning with Tem uh, Tiber I. The second volume described the War of the Red Diamond and the six emperors who followed. The third volume described the troubles of the next three emperors, the frustrated Uriel IV, the ineffectual Sephiroth II, and the heroic Uriel V. On Uriel V's death across the sea in the distant hostile Akavir, Uriel VI was but five years old. In fact, Uriel VI was born only shortly before his father left for Akavir. Uriel V's only other progeny by a Mor uh, sorry, Mor Morganatic ally uh, sorry, alliance were the twins uh, Mori Morihatha and Eloisa, who had been born a month after Uriel V left. Uriel VI was crowned in the 290th year of the Third Era. The imperial consort, uh, Thonica, as the boy's mother, was given restricted regency until Uriel VI reached his majority. The Elder Council retained the real power, as they had since the days of Katariah I. The Council so enjoyed its unlimited and unrestricted freedom to promulgate laws and generate profits that Uriel VI was not given full license to rule until 307, when he was already 22 years old. He had been slowly assuming positions of responsibility for years, but both the council and his mother, who en uh, enjoyed even her limited regency, were loath to hand over the reins. By the time he came to the throne, the mechanisms of government gave him little power ex uh, except for that of the imperial veto. This power, however, he regularly and vigorously exercised. By 313, Uriel VI could boast with conviction that he truly did rule Tamriel. He utilized defunct spy networks and guard units to bully and coerce the difficult members of the Elder Council. His half-sister, uh, Moriatha, was, not surprisingly, his staunchest ally, especially after her marriage to the uh, Baron Ulf Gerson of Winterhold brought her considerable wealth and influence. As the sage Ugaridge said, Uriel V conquered uh, Esrenet, but Uriel VI conquered the Elder Council. When Uriel VI fell off a horse and could not be resuscitated by the finest imperial healers, his beloved sister Moriatha took up the imperial tiara. 
At 25 years of age, she had been described by admittedly self-serving diplomats as the most beautiful creature in all of Tamriel. She was certainly well-learned, vivacious, athletic, and well a well-practiced politician. She brought the Archmagister of Skyrim to the Imperial City and created the second Imperial Battle Mage since the days of Tiber Septim. Uh, Moriatha finished her, the job her brother had begun and made the Imperial Province a true government under the Empress, and later the Emperor. Outside the Imperial Province, however, the Empire had been slowly disintegrating. Open revolutions and civil wars had raged unchallenged since the days of her grandfather, Severus II. Carefully coordinating her counterattacks, Moriatha slowly claimed back her rebellious vassals, always avoiding overextending herself. Though Moriatha's military campaigns were remarkably successful, her deliberate pace often frustrated the council. One councilman, an Argonian who took the Clovian name of Thoricles, Rom uh, Romus, furious at her refusal to send troops to his troubled Black Marsh, is commonly believed to have hired the assassins who claimed her life in the Third Era 339. Romus was summar summarily tried and executed, though he protested his innocence to the last. Moriatha had no surviving children, and Eloisa had died of a fever four years before. Eloisa's 25-year-old son, Pelagius, was thus crowned Pelagius IV. Pelagius IV continued his aunt's work, slowly be uh, bringing back under, the, under his wing the radical and refractory kingdoms, duchies and baronies of the empire. He excised Moriatha's uh, poise and uh, circumspect pace in his endeavors, but alas, he did not attain her success. The kingdoms had been free of constraint for so long that even a benign imperial presence was considered odious. Nevertheless, when Pelagius died after an astonishing 49-year reign, Tamriel was closer to uni unity than it had been since the days of Uriel I. Our current emperor, his awesome and terrible majesty, Uriel Septim VII, son of Pelagius IV, has the diligence of his great-aunt Moriatha, the political skill of his great-uncle Uriel VI, and the military prowess of his great-granduncle Uriel V. For 21 years, he has reigned and brought justice and order to Tamriel. In the year Third Era 389, however, his imperial battle mage, Jagar Tharn, betrayed him. Uriel VII was imprisoned in a dimension of Tharn's creation, and Tharn used his sorcery of illusion to assume the emperor's aspect. For the next 10 years, Tharn abused imperial privilege, but did not continue Uriel VII's schedule of reconquest. It is not yet entirely known what Tharn's goals and personal accomplishments were during the ten years that he masqueraded as his liege lord. In the Third Era 399, an enigmatic champion defeated the battle mage in the dungeons of the Imperial Palace and freed Uriel VII uh, from his other dimensional jail. Since his eman emancipation, Uriel Septim VII has worked diligently to renew the battles that would reunite Tamriel. Tharn's interference broke the momentum, it is true, but in the years since, uh, he has proven that there is hope for a golden age of Tiber Septim's rule glorifying Tamriel once again. Yeah, I'll leave these for another time. to this.
honor to be sure. You seem like very good company. Well, I find myself in pleasant company. Please share your thoughts. That's what got me damaged. Unbelievable. Still, I'm liking the view. By all me. means, I'm listening. Greetings, Dunder. Do you want something? I think I remember where this, uh, where this lady is. How does the day greet you, friend? This isn't canon, I just really want to get this out of my system. You won't escape me that easily. <laughs> well, it's a little stronger than I thought it would be. No! 
lesson learned. I think there's a couple of better ways I could have done that, but... Long live the king. Good to see you again, friend. I was just doing a little writing. Come to think of it, there might be some interesting things in the um, Imperial Cult services for me. I'll save it for another time, though. I'm content just to go down the sewers and um, maybe after that I'll consider alternatives. does not know you, so Ania has nothing to say to you. Greetings, friend. It's not what you said a minute ago. so they're most likely down that way, but I will take a quick minute. Help, help. These guys are no joke.
interesting, so apparently I've been here before. But I guess I just never noticed this. That's good to know, I probably won't need to waste that much time on, um... Reinvestigating. that aren't goblins, it's fair to say I'm off the, uh, I think I'm off the scent, but... Good God. <laughs> it's almost as good as Skull Crusher. Did they? No. Oh. Stop. What other nonsense did I wind up taking up for no reason? Thank <laughs> you. 
That's right, I took your egg. are so big, but it does make navigation a little tricky. We share the same company. What can I do for you? E excuse me, Sarah, but, well, you're the Nerevarine, a big hero, and I don't really know how to talk to important folk like you, except to say thank you, Sarah, for everything. Tell me about House Lalu. Yes, we both belong to House Lalu. Are you here to discuss it, business? No, I think that's fine. Now I kind of feel bad for taking his stuff, if that was his. interesting places that I can handle um, not following the path I originally set out. It would be nice to put uh, some of these quests behind me, but this is obviously a fairly high priority one. Stop hitting me. 
like the, um, the goblins in the arena. Alright, so I guess the catch here is that it's not at all obvious. That there's something I need to do there. Um, I've kind of been in the area, so let's uh, let's try and follow another path. Those falls at the wrong time, and that's all over. Anyways, I am going to be able to get uh, plenty of magical experience. seem like it is once I investigate. <laughs> um,
All right, these things are nightmares. says it's raw adamantine, but it doesn't look like I can, oh my god, I'm not weight taking 50 weight.
healing is my thing. Alright, so I'm glad I followed the instinct, but I am going to need to remember how to, um, how to get back to, uh, the area where I can explore. Is I am going to have a lot of my strength by the end of this, it looks like. Yeah, it did say I needed to find the. Um, well, I didn't have to, but. They did want me to find the Altmer who were uh, helping out with this. decisive about the death. to be the one that was a lock 100. Screw it. Let's try the master's pick first. Sue. 
viewers, I should probably be, um... I should probably be finding that, uh, Poison Dart Gang at some point, too. So as long as I'm finding new things to explore, um, I think I'm okay with hanging out down here. Finish repairing the floor today. Please pay what you owe. Remember, I can let the goblin loose just as easily as I trapped him. Rankings of the blessed, blessed are the bone men, for they serve without self in spirit forever. Blessed are the mist men, for they bend in the glory of the transcendent spirit. Blessed are the wrath men, for they render their rage unto the ages. Blessed are the masters, for they are uh, bridge pa the past and span the future. The litany of service, the bone men's orth, we die, we pray, to live, we serve. The master's voice, you swore to serve your Lord. I'm pretty sure I read that. Will be the end of you. Well, <laughs> at least I got to hear. 
here in stereo. Looks like I'm not able to reach the other stuff, so recall it is.
again, all for sale, but just not now. Um, so let's use up the prongs first. else. All right. So I'll drop a few things off that I know I kind of can't do without. So salts. Don't have enough vampire dust to do what I want with it. So now you go. All right. Now if I have any fortify speed, great. So what else does this bring? Um, fortify agility. Uh, damage magic actually I think might be... No, hang on. I was thinking it might be wick wheat, but that was uh, intelligence I think. Alright, well it's fairly clear I'm going to hang on to this for its fortify strength. This for okay. Um if I have a drain agility, so be it. I just don't think I do.
see what the drain magic it gives us. Better than I thought it was going to be, at least. Although I thought there was a um, drain personality somewhere. That's a shame. surprised I don't have any more drain fatigue, but I have it. me some space. I'm still going to need to um, get rid of some of the, uh, like the skooma and such. A is for Antronach, B is for Bungler's Bane, C is for Comberry. Ascendance of Dormer Law, I'm pretty sure I have.
it's not. I have to have Invocation of Azure. So let's get our new books out of the way and then we can we can think about next steps. Uh, Antecedents of Dwemer Law. This book is a historical account of the development of Dwemer Law and custom for, uh, from its roots in High Elven culture. In short, so far as I'm able to trace the order of development and the customs of the Bosmeri tribes, I believe it to have been in all ways compatible with the growth of Altmeri Law. The earlier liability for slaves and animals was mainly confined to surrender, which, as in Somerset Isles, later became compensation. And what does this matter for a study? Uh, sorry. And what does this matter for a study of our laws today? So far as concerns the influence of the Altmeri law upon our own, especially the Altmeri law of master and servant, the evidence of it is to be found in every judgment which has been recorded for the last 500 years. It has been stated already that we shall still repeat the reasoning of the Altmeri magistrates, empty as it is to the present day, and I will quickly show how Altmeri custom can be followed into the uh, courts of the Dwemer. In the laws of uh, Cardinar Watch, PD 1180, it is said, if one who is owned by another slays one who owns himself, the owner must pay the associates uh, three fine instruments and the body of the one who is owned. There are many other similar citations, and the same principle is extended even in the case of a centurion by which a man is killed. If at the common workbench one is slain by the animunculi, the associates of the slain may uh, disassemble the animunculi and take its parts within 30 days. It is instructive to compare that the Der uh, what Derek has mentioned concerning the rude beasts of the Tenmar forests, if a marsh cat was killed by an Argonian, his family were in disgrace till, it re, uh, till they retaliated by killing the Argonian or another like it. But further, if a marsh cat was killed by a fall from a tree, his relatives would take their revenge by toppling the tree and shattering its branches and casting them to every part of the forest. And upon that year in the, of the reign of Wolfharth and his sons, and the magnificence that was Mordrin Heinen ended in this world, uh, world representative of the Alshamawia and uh, Malik, Malikrashi and Aldsotha gathered at a great host at the vastness of the Aser Nadabet Pashi. Uh, even Hilbungard and Dorak Gusel were lured from their forge, and for a time the fires of and. Uh, <laughs> And Anabia were silent, and thus on the ninth day of mourning, many slaves and enemies were sacrificed, and the cup sorry, cup of passage was mixed according to the uh, direction of Hanan's formula. Two parts blood of traitors, one part heart of Daedra, part mixed bitter green petals, void salts, green lichens, and bone meal, one part moon sugar, five parts flynn. Combined blood, heart, moon sugar, and large ebony alembic, Heart, uh, heat fire fed by bones of traitors, condense vapors into a large ebony flask for a hot drink, stain, strain contents through scamp skin, and mix with flynn in large mug, slowly stirring with a glass rod. For a chilled drink, mix in flask with pure Skyrim ice and shake vigorously, strain throughout winged twilight membrane, and served in a gem encrusted goblet. The wake was considered a great success as the beverage killed a great many guests and thus Mordern Hyden was supplied with companions in the next world.
worth a try. Um, all right. interesting right now. Please go ahead. Exactly looking to uh, to increase the amount of weight I'm carrying. Honor to be sure. I must say, I find you most interesting. Right now. Oh, greetings. How do you do? At this point, I'm just going to see what I can sell to the, um, the alchemist. Doesn't have to be dramatic or anything. Just a chance to see where I stand and uh, try and lighten up the load a little bit. speed is actually kind of helpful. Paralyzed, decidedly less so. All right, I'm in. Now, what am I looking at in terms of? Um, I think I can get by. Sell another book. 
I've killed the two goblin war chiefs. I've killed the Altmer trainer Ar Armion. I've killed the Altmer trainer Yarnar. What was I trying to drop off again? Right. Um, coins. Amulets. Question now is: Is there anything else I want to sort of pick up and try and sell? Um, and the answer is sort of, but I'm worried that if I have anything left over here, I'm going to be carrying it around forever. So I think at this point, I'm just going to head back. If I found a place to rest in um, Bornhold, I wouldn't complain about that. really good for um, speed so I, I sort of tolerate them again with materials it's easy to overlook some of the more important ones at least for me it is See you again, friend. I... 
Grand one. Master of House Lalu. How may I serve you? Hey, you know my rank. Well, what's the status of the Garbin Goblin Army? Have you taken care of it yet? Better, boy. <laughs> Better yet. So I've heard you killed both of them. This will please the lady. And the Goblin Army. You've killed the War Chiefs and the Altmer Trainers, and you live to tell the tale. Interesting and surprising. Perhaps I've underestimated you, Caius. Rest assured, it won't happen again. Take this as a token of Our Lady's appreciation. Well done. Any other service? Hmm, I have nothing for you at this time. Speak with Gavis Drin, the Lord Archcanon. He was in consultation with Lady Elmalexia this very morning. Perhaps he has something for you. Here's Gavis Drin. Lord Archcanon is most likely in his office here at the temple. Go there if you wish to speak to him. Another perfect. A hard judge, but fair. Grace and mercy upon you, in her name, Sarah. Hmm, yes. You're the one that Lair mentioned. Interesting. You were to be of service to Our Lady. It is essential, and all would be displeased if you were to fail. What do you mean, service to Your Lady? Yes, beneath this temple there is a large sewer system built around the ruins of Morn Old Mornhold. You smell like you may have spent some time there. Regardless, in these ruins there lies a shrine. This shrine has been corrupted. Tell me more. The Shrine of the Dead was once a place of great power. It served as a channel to the ancestors, allowing the faithful to learn from them, to harness their powers. Over the years, it has been forgotten. It has grown sour. The power that radiates from the shrine has drawn hordes of undead to it. The Shrine of the Dead must be cleansed. Well, tell me more about the shrine as it was before. As I said, it holds immense power to speak with the ancestors and harness their power. The Lady Almalexia wishes to use this power for the good of Mor Morrowind. I realize that ancestor worship falls a bit outside traditional temple doctrine, but the Lady knows best, and in her will is law. To find the shrine, enter the sewers through the temple basement, and then head east to the ruined temple gardens, and then south to the Shrine of the Dead. And the cleansing. Oh, certainly not by you. This task falls to one of Almalexia's chosen. You will escort this young priest, Urvel Dulanif, to the shrine. Protect him well, Caius. His experience is limited, but he is necessary to complete the ritual. The shrine is protected by the profane, powerful liches who feed from the power of the shrine. You must destroy them for Dulani to perform his duties. I stress again, protect Dulani at all costs. It is he who must perform the ceremony. If he is not able, there are no others. What can you tell me about Almalexia? The most blessed lady, Almalexia, guides and protects us all. We bask in her glory and are glad. And the ancestors. The spirits of our dead live on in the, our world. They can know and affect the future, and they can speak with other spirits and work great magic. So we honor and gift them and show them love and ask them to help us. What about his duties? Can I give you duties if you do not join the temple? Yeah, fair enough. All right, so we are going... Well, before I do that, I want to empty my inventory. So, sewers through the basement, head east to the ruined temple gardens, and then south to the shrine. Oh, dear. Oh, my. Goddess, protect me. Yeah, yeah, I'll take care of you. I'm told that you will accompany me to the Shrine of the Dead and protect me as we travel together. Our Lady commands it, so I suppose we must go. 
Do you want me to stay with you? I'd be willing to wait here. I, I mean, it's up to you. Oh, if you insist. I mean, if you're completely sure. I better save just in case something goes wrong. So I'm gonna head back here, but the first thing I wanna do is to try and sell off as much of my weight as I can. What's good for the Empire is good for business, citizen. I wouldn't have expected to see the Nerevarine here in Mornhold. Faction members only, Dark Elf. Fair enough. Alright, that's promising. supposed to have talked to a ghost so I want to make sure that uh, it didn't have a name that I recognized. Yeah. 
kill him. Hoping it would be a little more straightforward than this. The good news is he's a little bit harder than he looks. Seems like they're trying. Just in case. I just really worried that my um strength didn't get sapped.
which is uh, keep him back. And honestly, keep myself back, but... Really? E excellent! I mean, I wouldn't want to get in the way. You understand. I'll guard you from back here. Alright, so I'm already down the strength. Killed the last of the profane liches guarding the Shrine of the Dead. Got it on the first try, right? Alright, so let's, before uh, I get too comfortable, let's get the restores out of the way. Killed the profane? Please take me to the Shrine of the Dead. I'd rather not speak of it. I know what must be done, but the place frightens me to the core. I don't know why I was chosen, but Our Lady believes I must be the one to go, and so the Shrine must be cleansed. Do you want me to stay with you? I'd be willing to wait here. I mean, it's up to you. Let's go to the Shrine. I will now cleanse the Shrine of the Dead. I suppose if I can, be with me, lady. Roldulini has succeeded in cleansing the Shrine. It is done. Please, can we return to the temple now? In a minute.
kind of taking the dead bodies as the signifiers that we were here. I am curious about one thing. Fair enough. Really hoping I remember the way back here. Come on, man. So, ministry will get me to the basement. Our Lady's blessings upon you, faithful servant. What is it? Have you settled that business with the Shrine of the Dead? Interesting. You've performed your duty well, Caius. The goddess is very pleased. Take this blessed spear as a gift from Lady Almalexia. It is good that you have been of service to the lady. Unfortunately, I know nothing that you may do for the lady now. Speak with Fedra Slayer. He usually has errands that must be completed by the lowly. Don't let him tell you he has nothing to be done. I'm sure he has something. I'm glad that's over. Mornhold, city of light, city of magic. Drin sent you to me? Priests. <laughs> As it happens, there was another way that you may be of service to Our Lady Almalexia. I spoke with the lady earlier today, and there may be something that one with your, uh, sorry, one of your skill will be able to help with. The Lady Almalexia would like you to retrieve a powerful artifact, Berylzar's Mazed Band. 
All I know is that the goddess wants it returned, and you'll find it in the ruins beneath the temple. Of course. Search to the northwest in the sewers. There was a passageway in the abandoned crypt that had been blocked off by a cave-in, but Almalexia had the area cleared. As for the item itself, I don't really see why you'd need to know more about it. If you must inquire, perhaps Gavis Drin can give you more details. Before I do any of that, I'm going to try and find these darts. Or rather, uh, people who throw the darts. The darts themselves are not very interesting. sure I want to be here. I mean, unless there's some kind of evidence that there's something for me to do here. This seems like a really good way for me to uh, fall off the edge and not Done a special assignment. 
from the tombs beneath the temple and return it at once. The band is supposed to be in an abandoned crypt, which I can reach through a passage in the southwest section of the temple sewers. This may not be the, exactly the right way, but... Oh yeah, it's this... Okay, you know what? It's Temple Guard, so let's go to Temple Sewers and do it right. Um, I think if I just get to Temple Sewers, I'll, I'll be able to sort it out. <clears throat> Excuse me. was a bit of a red herring. So this seems to turn east. It's a lot of potions.
You have no place here, child of living flesh. The mazed band must not be allowed to leave this tomb. The band should never have existed at all, and that was my folly, and this is my curse. For all eternity, I am damned to walk this half-life, to keep my creation from destroying the hearts and minds of mortals. Those who would challenge my fate will pay with their lives. Ascended to level 45, the results of hard work and dedication always look like luck to saps, but you know that you've earned every ounce of your success. So we've maxed out another trait. Um, I guess it's speed and agility now. Stranger, listen, I have a message I must tell you. My name is Variner. I was killed by the Black Dart Gang. I beg you, avenge my death. Their hideout is in Old Mournhold, Temple, Temple Sewers West. Many have died fighting them, but there is a mechanism that can bring, uh, that can flood the room, drowning the gang. Find the lever that looks like a torch holder near the east of the chamber. But whatever you do, don't get too close or you will join me in the afterlife. All right, Temple Sewers West it is. Stand head height.
not. Oh god. Morning. This is my box. What I say, uh, what I keep all my stuff in. Stay out or I'll make you dead like Gilzer's pet Durzog. Let it stop moving after he sat on it. As far as mechanisms go, I've clearly missed the point. I want to see if I can loot. Thank <laughs> you. 
Bullets don't actually do that much damage. was not worth it. Now I think I also have to find the ghost again. And the lady for that matter, but I'm probably going to be able to find her.
vanished. Alexia knows and sees. Have you retrieved uh, Barlazar's mazed band? Whatever you want, within reason. You got the mazed band. Interesting. I won't be the one to take it. Speak with the priest, Drin. He'll know what should be done. to retrieve barrels are uh, sorry barrels are mazed band are you not You've been able to retrieve the maze band amazing Almalexi will want to hear about this immediately you are to speak with her directly I hope you realize what an honor you're receiving Caius yes the lady requests your presence at once it's best not to keep her waiting you will find her in the high Our chapel lady's blessings upon me faithful servant justice never sleeps And on that note, it's a little bit early, but it is also extremely late um, where I'm at. So we'll leave it there. Sorry for um, the vodcast people on Twitch. I'm sorry about the upload problem that caused me to do it Wednesday evening. As for the rest of you, I will see you all next week. Thank you very much for watching, and uh, until next time.